recording officially right now, so we're all um, all captured. But I, I still would like to request a backup remotely, and actually a person here. So who can do that on site here for us? Have a good. Um, does anyone have OBS or any screen capture set up that they can record as well? I will be. Uh, I will be us in the camera. I just need to we need to get all set up and just do it from that point of view. You guys are doing the same thing. Okay. Yeah, I've started uh, recording. I don't know how useful this will be from this angle. Um, but. and that's just their camera recording. Yeah, it's actually not. Yeah, I couldn't. Yeah. Get it. Do you want to maybe just pull? point that to me yeah. like maybe put it over there so we're gonna figure all this out and um, part of it is also we haven't set up the towers but we've got 30 acres here and we are gonna set up towers where we're blanketing the whole site with internet so we can report from the field as well at any time so it's, it's something we're actively developing as we go on here um, but okay now where's Wes um, Wes I think I was. <laughs> and he, he's, he's, he's definitely here. <laughs> okay. He moved. Well, <laughs> okay. We'll, uh, <laughs> yeah. No. When I knocked on the door, I heard. Me. Um. Oh. And Jeff. I mean, Jeff had a long night, too. So okay. Well, let's let's start with. <laughs> we've got six of us here. So hello to the <laughs> the team locally. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, so we've got a few of us here and myself. Uh, Katarina and Jeff. Katarina's going to join us later on today. Jeff, I don't know where, where he's at. Uh, my camera went out of focus. Let's see if we can do that, get them back into focus. Okay, um, so let's get going here. So this is lesson number one. And what I'll, what I'll do is uh, we'll try to also keep, keep to the schedule. I'm sorry we're late today. We're getting set up. But we'll go basically from 8 to 9 every single day. On Saturdays, we focus on global collaboration. So as we do this here with a little bit of remote presence, how do we involve the whole world in this? Because the, one of the big learnings over the years has been that hardware takes, open source hardware takes infinite amounts of time to develop. If you can leverage remote collaboration or crowd collaboration, you can do really well at the process. And that's something that I don't think anyone has figured out what we're going to go for so one of the big themes um, so the main theme of the six month immersion on site here um, and then so right now there's two months that we're here preparing and then there's the three months of the of the summer of extreme design build which is the intense build sessions including the cd go home but right now we're going to build build ourselves a cd go home to start over the next couple of weeks um, the focus is the house as a as a productized just just for an overview of where we're at right now the house is uh, a product that we think can really take the project forward and the way that that it came about right before covid we were doing a lot with steam camps and 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 3d printers but when covid hit we we kind of reevaluated and thought about okay what are some bigger solutions and kind of you know all that reflection that came around that time in our ample spare time uh, the thing that came came up to the front was the house which builds upon the work of open building institute the compressed earth block press that we've done uh, with the open building institute the culmination of, of some of the development techniques that we can do which is uh, the extreme manufacturing bit the idea that you modularize a build and have a large swarm of people work on it together to really um, compress the build schedules which therefore means a, a potential of a robust business model so we're focusing around the house as the core and then around all the supporting technologies around that and and I think that a huge one is the 3d printing and that's what we'll do that we're planning on a hundred thousand dollar prize so we've got that in the budget for this year uh, spawn us a, a prize on hero X as an incentive challenge to develop the full infrastructure for large-scale printing from trash so that's the problem statement can we do it and nobody's done it in the open source. There's plenty of large, high-performance proprietary printers. As far as plastic supply um, for houses, well, it's like, do you want to live in a plastic house? Well, this thing like plastic lumber, but we, what, what about um, solving plastic waste and housing at the same time? Right now, lumber prices are super high. You can do, do uh, plastic composites with, with, for example, sawdust that look like 
wood and smell like wood. Uh, the, but the first question there is actually, do you have enough plastic around? And the numbers, I ju just looked at this a couple of days to, to get my story straight, and the number is 300 million tons of plastic are produced per year, of which about 50% turns into trash every single year. That's 150 million tons. Now that translates to, if you look at the weight of a house, a house, if we were to build the entire CD home to the current model, 1,000 square foot, that's about 10 tons of lumber that can be replaced. So if, if that's about the whole house, that's most of it. Now it doesn't include, say, concrete for foundation. But if that is most of the house, including things like, okay, the flat roof, the EPDM uh, rubber roofing, 3D printable, that's thermoplastic urethane or thermoplastic olefins. Well, anyway, the story is about 10 tons per house. And that makes for 15 million houses annually from the waste stream. Now, that's about 10 times more than the housing need in the United States. In the United States, they make about a, a million houses, a million point two or point five. So there is an ample stock hmm. there that um, if we can learn about, learn to do that process effectively, what does it mean? You're shredding. That means you're extruding filament. Now, filament is the most effective way to, to do, get highly controlled prints. You can also do pellets, a fused pellet fabrication. Uh, like our collaborators from Michigan Tech University are doing. Joshua Pierce, a close collaborator. He's sending us 100 pounds of uh, polycarbonate to experiment with. But we're collaborating, and, and they've done that, and we, we may do that. Uh, but the, the lower-hanging fruit for us on our side is the filament, where you talk about with a super volcano, one of the larger nozzles, that, and we can also, we're going to experiment with that here throughout the summer, uh, 20 pounds per day per print head, um, for the super volcano nozzle with existing open source technology. So that's the current state of art. Now put a few heads of that on a single printer, um, four. That would be easy, relatively easy. You can probably go up to eight. Uh, you're going to look and have to pay attention more to, to bed leveling issues. But four, piece of cake, 80 pounds a day. Hey, talking about what is it, 30, 45 days, enough lumber for an entire house? We'll just let that thing cook in the background. Automation. So that's the whole theme here. Like as we go through the CD Co home. So right now, um, this current one, we've started about January. Um, in the middle of winter. Actually, December. Je December, we poured the foundation. Uh, and then going into it, we were doing the, all the build instructionals and everything. And we found that, oh, wow, we could we kept on innovating on it we didn't freeze it we said okay let's do this better because we've already built a bunch of these uh, using the modular build system um, we kept on improving and what comes out is that end, end of the day it's really going to be optimization to the point where you're automating a lot of things one immediate way you can do it today is through the 3d printing and that's why we're excited about that so there's the 3d printer but on top of that uh, you can also do what we're doing a lot of this year is there's the heavy machines and CNC torch tables that gets you to the heavy machines or the CNC torch table that gets you to cutting out parts for the brick press, for the shredder, tractors, and everything else. So if we can master 3D printing and CNC torch tabling, you've got the ability to master plast anything that's made of plastic. And then if you've got the metal cutting, if you've got virgin stock, then you can make any three-dimensional objects because what we do here is like, for example, for the CEB press, you take two-dimensional steel and then you weld it up after you cut it out on a CNC torch table. So that's, that's the, uh, the basic process that we do. Now to that, we're also going to add, and this is now talking about the universal access system, the, the CNC motion systems that we do have, which are scalable to, will work a lot this year with one inch sized rods. Uh, the 3D printers that we produce right now are eight millimeter rods, just uh, pretty small. That's a standard, industry standard for the small desktop printers. Uh, but going to one inch, you get into the meter scale of fabrication that's accurate. So you're talking about moving various tool heads, whether a print head or anything else, 
at the resolution of 10 microns using the current system that we have. So uh, 10 microns, what is it? Uh, we'll talk a lot throughout the whole process, we'll talk a lot about numeracy. Uh, in order to design things, you have to wield tools of CAD, you have to collaborate, you have to be numerate, that's the calculations. And you have to do bills of materials, where you relate the bill of materials to the CAD. At all times through the process, what we do is when we design, we design for build because we're built, like throughout the history of this project, we, we were the ones building it and therefore we have the accountability to say, okay, this is how you, you design it so it's the easiest to build. And just to point out, that's not how the world typically works. Like an architect does not typically not build a house. Uh, there's a, a bunch of disconnect, like the engineer is not the architect, the architect's not the builder, the builder's not the user, the user's not the repairman. That kind of a broken tool chain gets you a lot of inefficiency, which you're just leveraging to say, hey, we're going to integrate all that with Digital Housing 2.0, and we're going to iron it out to get cost performance that's unbeatable. So right now, the, just the general overview of the cost structure is 50,000 materials and 50,000 for a product that we can do if we go out into the wild and, and have a client who we built for, uh, 50K we could charge. And the, the question here is to look at under the hood of those numbers and say, okay, does it all work out for the whole operation, uh, for the cash flow, for, for everything else about it? Now, uh, stick frame, that's used in places that are typically not the tropics. That's light frame construction. Might apply to Germany, to Poland, to here. <laughs> Um, but in the tropics, you're going to go different. You, you're going to be using CEBs there because wood, termites eat it. So you can't do wood mm. or you don't have wood because you're in a desert. So the CEBs come into here and next year we're aiming to go for with the, the brick press. Uh, for me, it's a revival of the brick press because, we, you know, we've been sitting on it for a long time. We never productize it. it we, we build it here and there um, on demand, but we never really productize it. The, the possibilities are there. I was just looking at... <laughs> The kind of uh, what we have right now is a machine that that performs the equivalent. The next next competitor is fifty two thousand dollars. We can build our machine right now. Uh, the materials are about five thousand. We're selling them at ten thousand. So we right now we've got a business model that's five x over industry standards. Now we might not have a website or as good customer service. But those are things to be developed, right? That's called business development. Now, I was getting excited last night. I was looking at the existing current uh, state of art in brick press. And uh, there's a machine that produces about uh, eight block per minute. Costs $144,000. The blocks are twice the size of ours. So that would mean the equivalent of 12... Uh, 16 on our machine. We, we have 6 by 12 block that's 4 inches tall. Uh, but just looking at those numbers, I mean, just think about that. The machine we're going to design, well, we have designed. Our current machine, I was actually going through the new hydraulics on that last night and getting parts. We're going to build ourselves one that makes... Um, we typically built ones that are 6 block per minute. This time we're building one that's 9 block per minute and it's readily scalable to 12 block per minute by adding another power cube because of the way that the, 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 the design is scalable. Um, typically you can't do that, but if you design it for scalability, it's just the addition of another power cube that makes it go from 9 to 12. Now at 12, um, that's three quarters of the productivity of a $144,000 machine. That's pretty good. Right, so I mean, we're talking about uh, we are, and we're gonna put that to work. We're gonna make that work here. We're building a workshop um, of those CEBs. We're gonna build ourselves the press, and then we're gonna build a workshop. So we're gonna experiment with the rapid build workflows, which we've proven in Belize. In Belize, we were able to get block laying with a chain of people. Uh, that was, this was in 2019, no, 2020, right before COVID hit. Uh, we did that. We were laying block like a couple of seconds per block. I mean, you can do it really, really fast if you've got all the techniques down and you work out all the blocks. We're going to attempt to do that here and build a 3,000 square foot workshop here. So it's going to be an off-grid solar uh, concrete pad. And then uh, we're going to experiment with the rebar trusses as well as the, the CEBs. 
for a very low cost, um, and it's gonna have a PV roof on top of that, so we gotta, we still actually gotta order that, get that shipped in. Um, but we're gonna experiment with, okay, can you actually do this super efficiently? And we think we can, and um, I think it took a long time to get here, but it's actually quite exciting because um, we can do it at such a lower lower price point. Um, here on our side, we want to build the CEB homes next year. Um, there's definitely huge interest for making that accessible to anybody. So that's on a on a block press. So what are some of the what I wanted to go through today is kind of the overall program. So the overall program is the focus on the house. There's the brick press. We're going to give a very serious attempt at getting the commercially viable large-scale 3D printing infrastructure from trash with the shredder and filament maker. For the shredder, in order to make that quite accessible, the torch table cuts out the blades. That's how it works. For the tractor, uh, we, tr we cut that out of stock, cut a lot of the parts out of stock steel, so it's once again the torch table. Between 3D printed plastic of any size, oh yeah, how about some rubber tires? Oh yeah, rubber tracks. That's a reality. So I got, I got some, um, we've got a bunch of um, TPU. We're going to work on making filament out of that. Uh, so that's going to be pretty exciting. Uh, what we're going to do here is build, um, yeah, we, we do plan on building the torch tables. Um, not, not this first month, but, but a little later. And then using a lot of the one inch universal axis components, the CNC robots for that, to do other things, including putting other heads such as a MIG welder head, which turns that into wire arc additive manufacturing. So that that could be very exciting. And um, But what, what, what I want to get across is the idea of, like, okay, there's these crazy technologies like WAM, the wire arc additive manufacturing for full metal prints that are only a couple of millimeters, maybe two to four millimeters accurate. They're not super accurate, but for a lot of parts like sprockets or tractor frames or entire brick presses, that's perfectly fine. So that is quite exciting. Um, and then just to, just to kind of wrap up, I mean, there's, there's a lot of builds happening. We're going to go up to the two inch universal axis. And then it comes into, gets into how simple can you make a system like that where we're scaling exactly the same system as the 8 millimeter universal axis. It's just a stepper motor. It's just a pulley with a fatter belt that can pull about um, each of the belts on a small printer may, may be able to get like, I don't, I don't know what exact figure, I can never track it down, but it's, it's around like 10 pounds maybe or 20 pounds. <laughs> Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on that, but with the 15 millimeter belts, using a larger stepper motor, we can get to CNC drive systems with two inch universal axes. So that means now heavy duty machining and about 240 pounds of drive force for the tool motion. So that's kind of the basic numeracy there. Uh, but that, that can get us to uh, hopefully to things like you can do a simple <coughs> lathe kind of thing, CNC drill. We've, we've done a high power drill here too. Uh, CNC, basic CNC axis system that if you keep stacking the one axis upon another, you've got something that looks like a, like a screw machine, which means multiple CNC axes that are working together with different tool heads. So you can have both rotary motion and linear motion. Um, mm. So that's, we're going to get up to that. And that's, uh, that's pretty good. Um, so just kind of start wrapping your head. Like you have to be thinking about, okay, um, do I have the structure to, to do it? Do I have the force to do it? Do I have an easy way to mount the tool heads to the system? Can the frames support it? So we've got all those components. We know how to make frames. We know how to make frames up to bulldozers from the four inch we've done four inch tubing up to half inch wall which gets you a solid bulldozer frame okay great same tubing lighter gauge which is 
quarter inch get you a little lighter machines um, back was all but all the heavy machines are doable with that so you got frames now if you want a big CNC machine you can use either kind of the kind of tubing system or the stuff we use with the 3d printers which are which are angle and corner brackets right now that you can do on a small scale you can actually scale up the corner pieces and probably do things like quarter inch by two inch angle for frames probably with the 3d printed pieces probably have the limit of about a meter you know like four by four by four feet if you want to build a printer like that yeah you can do the 3d printed corners plus the steel if you want to go bigger than that so we're going to go for a four by four by eight 3d printer we may start with a four by four by four just to get the hang of it get the universal axes at one inch worked out and then move to the to the one that makes full just full lumber like eight foot tall size um, so there you want to start getting it probably want to get away from the printed corners you want to probably get into just weld the frame together or use the the box beam like on a tractor or use the the newest love in town here which is the rebar trusses which are really effective like we just did that but the rebar trusses welded from half inch rebar are very effective so we can build the equivalent of a two by two by twelve u.s lumber which costs sixty dollars right now if you weld it out of rebar uh, you get that for fifteen dollars so mm. a, right now there's a definite huge cost advantage and then if you look at on the wiki on a cnc sawmill for example um, or the workshop structure, the large workshop structure, then you can see much larger structures that um, can be made of the rebar. Like you can take one truss, like a flat truss, which will be wobbly this way, but put four of them together in a box structure. That's columns and roof rafters. A very interesting thing about this rebar thing is, so say you've got this, um, this truss, say that the square truss made of four uh, trusses of rebar so I hope you're getting the picture of this but you can just keep welding on additional trusses to the side of that so you can comp it's it's very scalable so you can make that I, I didn't really uh, go into the details of how much you can do with it but we know right now that the $15 one half rebar structure with that's can you guys still hear me Mm -hmm. okay um, that is 20 feet long here like six meters or so that's um, that's an equivalent of a 2 by 12 by 16 more like 2 by 12 by 20 lumber so think about what happens when you stack my videos cut out there think about what happens when you stack those pieces of lumber together you get way more strength you get like eye beams well, with the rebar technique, just welding another truss to that, you can do that even after you put the, like I was thinking about, okay, how do we build this workshop? What if it doesn't have enough structure because Team Brazil didn't come through with a finite element analysis in FreeCAD to make sure it does? We're going to get into that kind of stuff. We've got a good guy for, who's going to teach us how to do that in FreeCAD. You can do structural analysis relatively easily if you understand the principles but okay so you got these trusses that you can keep stacking on like thinking about okay here's this piece of uh, 2 by 12 lumber you just keep stacking man that gets into industrial grade construction and talking about more than one story multiple stories and so forth so yeah very powerful as I'm quite excited about these things because at the limit there's a limit to the universal axis with the round tubes after so much distance they sag the experience here has been that even the one inch axis on the torch table that we built a couple of years ago span that 10 feet and it starts to sag under its own weight it's heavy you got wow. two of the, you know it starts to sag so the question is okay what if you want a longer torch table that's 12 feet or a sawmill that's longer like 20 feet sawmill the rebar trusses I think are really useful there you could use stock steel uh, like angles and things like that but in this game here we go into radical part count reduction so if you can get this trust to work on this rebar thing to work on for many different purposes that's really good
So imagine getting the frames, like even for the machines, or the sawmill, or the workshop structure, trusses and vertical columns. Well, the cool thing about the rebar thing is, so we, we just did that this year. Uh, cool thing is very easy to weld. It's just basic. You don't have to be precise. It's, it's very basic, so very cool. Um, so, and then just to cover the, the three months of the summer X, there's going to be a lot of builds there, including the, the house, the aquaponic greenhouse. Then we build the 3D printer, the large scale 3D printer, torch table, tractor, and, and a bunch of other things there. There's going to be a whole two weeks where we actually play with the universal axes uh, so we can do both the one inch and two inch versions and go from there. So maybe what I'll wrap up with, so we, we're in about halfway, 8.30. What I want to wrap up with is, um, we have a half a, an hour left here, but I want to talk about like understanding, like what's the state of art? How do we understand what's really feasible with easily accessible open source technology? Like what can we do right now, right here, so that when we go into the, these six months, we can understand that and, and kind of guide, gauge ourselves what, what the real practicality is. So let's, let's go through a little bit of that. Now, before we go into that, um, I do want to back up into the, the large scale collaboration a bit because that's the big part that I think uh, the world needs solving for uh, to solve issues faster than they're created because right now humanity tends to cause a lot of issues. We're not providing enough solutions. Uh, so collaboration is kind of the next thing that society needs to wake up to and we're practicing that here. Now, the limit of that, that we're going to do the experiment, I do want to go back to the, the, hack, the big hackathon, the, the extreme, we call that the extreme enterprise hackathon. Uh, well, that's another thing. That's, that's a, we're talking about two things. There's one, you can do large scale live events where many people collaborate. Um, that's not the incentive challenge. There's, there's two things. So the distinction is there's hackathons where uh, in history, human history, people have done hackathons with like thousands of people. Now the question is like, how how well can you coordinate that, and where does that all go to? Can you actually start using that kind of a technique to get real products? Uh, well, that requires a very high level of sophistication, I would say, an understanding of the design process for everybody to to participate. So unless you've got a bunch of people who are designers already, that's pretty hard. Uh, what we're trying to change here is make all these techniques accessible because the thing from open source software that we learned regarding success of Linux is the modular breakdown part. So if you can break down the problem into so many parts and create a collaboration architecture of people where each person takes a manageable chunk, uh, there's just really crazy stuff that's possible. and. I don't think too many people are doing it because everybody's proprietary and that's that's the thing like uh, unless people are willing to share radically their their cutting edge knowledge this doesn't happen that's that's the reason why it doesn't happen right now I mean nobody shares cutting edge knowledge in college you don't get cutting edge knowledge because companies that have it they don't share it and then you end up working for them and you keep it proprietary, but you don't. I, I've seen it in my education. I, um, like for one, I couldn't talk openly about my work and I thought it was a complete waste because we're not really helping each other solve problems, which is what I came to grad school for. I got ba badly disappointed about that. So the solution on that is to, yeah, we've got to change culture, shift culture around and here we're going to practice that. Uh, and one, pra one very definite practice we can go at this is the, the um, not the hackathon, but now the incentive challenge. So we're funding a prize. We're saying, okay, these are the goals. So here's your big 3D printer, high temperature chamber, film and making infrastructure from trash. So we actually solve that question. Nobody solved it. Nobody prints from trash right now that I know of. Um, or at, at any significant scale, anything that's got any traction. It, it's somewhat of a low-hanging fruit, and um, we'll take an honest stab at it. Now, I want to mention one thing about HeroX. So HeroX is an incentive challenge platform, but on it, uh, everyone there competes, actually. So we're going to change the rules. Uh, there's a 
interesting point to that because when you look at the rules of that that contest you're not allowed to collaborate. I mean, people are competing for a prize. The rules are typically, and you read this, like I went through a bunch of them and everywhere, like every single project says, if you cheat, you're disqualified. What's cheating? Cheating is actually collaborating with others, i.e. taking their, building upon their work. Man, that is so backwards if you think about it. So we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna say the rules of the game are you're forced, you're required to share and you're going to be rewarded like you're going to be scored based on how much you collaborate, how much you publish, and how much you use other people's content. Right? Now, can we get different? So there's, a, there's an important point to that. Can we actually do better with that kind of a process? So that will be a data point because, for one, it's never happened on Earth. Like, <laughs> name one single challenge of any kind which was collaborative. Truly. That means all the groups were actually sharing their best knowledge and pulling together to a better product i mean you can you can imagine that the product could be better now there might be some blocks to that you definitely i mean definitely are there's a thing called collaborative waste it's called coordination losses and getting everybody on board and organized so there's definite challenges but it's it's something really worth worth solving for and um i Please show me an example where this exists, because I, I, I don't see it. And, and not only that, I mean, a lot of the incentive challenges out there, a lot of them make proprietary products, too. Um, so it's effectively kind of like getting a whole plantation of, <laughs> of slaves to work for you, and you pr proprietize the product. Well, that's not what we're going to do here. We're going to make it absolutely open and hopefully get a different result. So we'll see. And... Um, in open source hardware, the thing we're solving for still is people showing up. We think that with this incentive challenge, there might be enough participation. And you, you all are actually welcome to participate on it. We thought, okay, do the rules say, can we participate in that? Yeah, as under the rule that if we are publishing everything absolutely openly, that means we don't have any advantage. Yes, we've got the machines here, we can build that, but we're publishing everything. And therefore, we're bringing up the whole world to be able to build upon what we have so therefore we don't have a specific advantage therefore we can also compete be contestants in a project uh, without a conflict of interest I would say and we can make that even a value proposition we're saying hey we're here to help you work with us and this, this is this is how we're setting up the rules we're setting up the rules for absolute collaboration which doesn't happen normally so that's that's an important point and this Saturday we're gonna start start working on that so that means uh, you know we've got a bunch of work on it already on a wiki with the OSC incentive challenge um, but the Saturdays are the global collaboration date so we'll work on that and start to organize that and post that on the uh, hero X will you know we'll talk to them and see see what uh, talk to their team the hero X team and drop all the assets um, guidelines, judging criteria, and, and organize all the information that we already have on the topic so that uh, the biggest value we can provide is share and make transparent all the information that we already know about this. And we're going to uh, set it up so that there's some admissible parts, like key things that already work, you know, like don't reinvent the wheel, the universal access works like this, you can do that very easily. Um, if you have a lower cost system, feel free to use it, but I don't think you, you're going to come up with anything lower cost and higher performance scalable like this. So yeah, um, that's, that's an important point. Um, so that's the, that will be the incentive challenge. And we here in the group and also the remote collaborators, we, we encourage you also to collaborate on that and get it posted up so, so that we can, um, we can get a real product out there to the world and possibly solve the a lot of the issues around waste plastic uh, so in the last so we've got like 20 minutes left on this session here but what i want to do is um, start wrapping your mind around okay what are the limits of feasibility of what we can do so let's talk about forces sizes um existing technologies that kind of the the survey of what's feasible today so first of all about distances like on the universal axis, uh, wrap your head around, what is the accuracy on that? 
if you look at the step size of the stepper motor, so right now technology exists where in open source you can control stepper motors accurately using open source tool chains. The stepper motors are not open source themselves particularly, but um, the, the hardware that runs them, the electronic controllers there are, there's open design for that. But for a long time, people have had stepper stepper motors and stepper driver systems, and that, that gets you 10 micron accuracy using the very basic system with a kind of belting and pulleys on either small or large stepper motors. So what's 10 microns? Uh, can you picture that? That's like two thousand, half a thousandth of an inch. Well, what is that? That's called precision machining. So you can not only 3D print, like 3D prints are quite accurate, not, not super accurate, but the universal access system in a basic stepper motor drive system can get you to about the half a thousandth, which is uh, engine material, like start making engines. If you make a three-dimensional mill with the universal axis, you can make an engine or a hy hydraulic, uh, hydraulic oh. pump or motor. Uh, now, there's a limit to that though, so, so that's the absolute limit. Let's talk about how, how big is that compared to what you can do with oh. your hand? What can you do with your hand in terms of accuracy? It'll be about a millimeter. So 10 microns, you're talking about a, about a thousand factor better than you can do with your hand. And what's the ultimate limit of human technology beyond that? I would call that microchips, which are nanometer scale. So after micro, what's after micro? It's nano. Nano is 10 to the negative 9th on the meter. But when you talk about microchips, you're talking another factor of a thousand over the universal axis. All right, so we'll save that for another year. That's a little, little much for now. But if you think about the limits, see, I, I thought about this because it's like I'm trying to explain, well, what's this accuracy that... Uh, this is actually very good. Like I'm learning a lot as I'm trying to share this. Because I can tell you right now, like, mic how many nanometers are the feature sizes on a microchip? Like, we're down to like a few nanometers these days, right? We said that the universal axis is about 10 micrometers, so there's a thousand. And compared to a human, you get a few millimeters accuracy, what you can do manually by hand. So there's a thousand and a thousand. So that's kind of the general perspective there. Now, if we do have the, the, the 10 microns there, uh, can we really get that 10 micron resolution on a precision part? Well, that's going to depend on whether your frame and your tooling is stiff enough it doesn't wobble. And um, with heavy machining, if you have a lot of force, um, you're going to make things wobble. Uh, so uh, if you want super precision, and we can experiment with this grinding. So grinding is the next level of precision that if you have say the universal axis because the forces on a grinder a grinder is a very fast spinning blade like a grit gritty blade it's not like contact machining with like metal bits that rub against the metal like a drill bit or a mill bit when you get into the the grinder part the forces are much less and therefore you can get much more precision so that's just a th thing to think about so if you want to uh, get more accurate things like bores precision bores for uh, like <laughs> air bearings which are kind of the level of technology you need for for semi semiconductor technology yeah you can actually get from the universal axis into the more precise air kind of bearings uh, the limit so um, on the wiki there's an article about air bearings but that technology uh, somebody did publish how to do an air bearing lathe. What's an air bearing? So air bearings are where the steel is so smooth that you're not actually using balls, but you have, say, a rod inside a cylinder, and just the air friction between the two gets you that perfect frictionless existence. So you can take, uh, with a machine that 
in a state of art of what you can do if you if you're pretty good at we could probably do this um, so you need a very precise motion system but then grinding in order to get that kind of precision because machining no like there's too much vibration and chatter in the in the bits which you can't do it with but take the universal axis plus grinding and you can now get to the next step of technology which gets you to the air bearing style of technology uh, and there's a video I can put a link on that it's, it's on the wiki um, so that's that's about the dimensions of precision so what about things like how do you how do you calculate like how much your frame can withstand well the basics there like the thing that we have to understand things like if you build a tractor like if you're going to be pushing dirt around or whatever driving is the frame going to bend on you or whatever how do you know that uh you can go into free CAD finite element analysis you can do back of the envelope calculations in the back of the envelope think about the in english units here psi pounds per square inch of compressive strength of materials so steel is going to be about 50,000 or up to that's mild steel but hard steel is going to be up to 150,000 pounds per square inch so what's that mean so for example if you have a rod <clears throat> compressive strength is typically that when you press it down on it tensile strength is when you pull it there those values are similar but so what's that mean if you've got a one inch shaft what can you hold on it you can 50,000 pounds per square inch well there's about a square inch of material there and so this is just rough, rough thinking about how you analyze problems so you have a one inch shaft how much can you suspend from it what's the answer to that like steel steel wire that's one inch thick how much can it hold based on the 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 basic property of that material which is say 50,000 or 100,000 pounds per square inch of strength that's what PSI is if you understand that figure then you can start getting into back of the envelope calculations what, what that said right there is that that one inch rope will hold you 100,000 pounds like a whole house can sustain by a one inch rope you have to get into this kind of thinking where you're saying okay that's steel okay got it 50,000 and up then you think about plastics what are plastics how much can a piece of PLA that's one inch thick hold can <laughs> what's the PSI of plastics it's on a 5,000 pound scale 5 to 10 maybe up to 20 20 gets into the like aluminum like strong plastics are like weak aluminum but that standard plastic we print on our printer it's about 5,000 so I print myself a rod of 5,000. From that rod, ideally, max, I can hold 5,000 pounds. I can hold a car by that one-inch rod. It sounds amazing. It'll probably fail before that. That'll be the absolute limit. Um, but yet, once you get into, think about PSIs, and then you can think about back of the envelope calculations. So if you have a quarter-inch, you know, like you have something that's quarter-inch, yeah, and you're thinking, oh, okay, how much can it hold? Maybe how much can it compress? Start getting at, okay, say quarter inch. Say it's one inch long. Okay, take a quarter of that 50,000 figure. So you can do very quick calculations like that, and it's very helpful. Brian? How does it change if it's two inches? Yeah, I just double it. It's, it's pretty much really linear. It's that much more? Great question. Yeah. So if you have yeah, it's two, scalable. two steel cables, 50K <laughs> each, you can hang 100,000. Yeah. It's additive, so so there's all these uh, kinds of properties like additivity is typically true. First, like to the first order, like we're talking about back of the envelope calculations, just first order of approximation. Right. If you're gonna get into details, it might be off, but it's not. It's typically not gonna be like two x more than two times off. Only when you're so, dealing with really small or really large quantities, right? That's when the uh, the precision comes into play with the detail well if you have a very thin thing and you take a just a little bit off of it you might break the whole thing right <laughs> I mean so that kind of thinking you have you know uh, it's useful to engage in this very basic thinking it's called first principles thinking uh, where if you understand the ba basics physics quantities then you can get into a lot you can 
so I make a big point about numeracy and, and we'll have a session dedicated to numeracy where you know readily come out questions like okay I'm at factory farm here I'm gonna build a pond and pump water up to it how many kilowatts of power can I get for solar for storage if I pump with solar during the day okay that's a basic first principles question there's weight there's MKS me M is meter K is kilogram S is second those three units <coughs> make up all the physical properties of the world then you get into electromagnetics and stuff like that and nuclear stuff but for the physical world if you understand those those three things like okay you understand all of physics so if you understand what a meter is if you understand what a kilogram is if you understand what a second is and then you have to understand some derived units like what is what's weight what is force force is mass times acceleration for example right this is basic physics you might have heard that uh, but the big point being those three quantities you know they, they seem very simple but that plus a few very basic formulas and you can answer that question how much kilowatt average am I gonna have from that thing I designed as a physical system or a question like um, if I design this tractor, how much dirt can I push around? Once again, MKS, basics of here's weight. Um, you have to get into derived units like there's forces. There's, for example, pre if you talk about now, you want to do compressed air storage. There's forces there like pressure. You have to know what pressure is. Pressure is force per area. Right? So there's all these very basic principles that you're not going to learn in physics because <laughs> I, I took physics I was a physics major I didn't learn any of this <coughs> uh, I learned a bunch of formulas that didn't make a lot of sense but you have to go at it after that you kind of have to think about it really understanding like what's the significance of those things that you heard about or maybe didn't pay attention in school um, my history has been like even with the advanced physics stuff at the PhD level um, there's a lot of merit to it but the thing that's missing typically is like if you don't have a purpose to why you're learning it it's like so what so for example like I studied wavelets you know like wave propagation in the, my physics about turbulence and tokamaks well interestingly wavelets came up like later on when it came to image processing same kind of stuff you know about how yeah so if you have basically my point is if you see a purpose like uh, for rapid learning you want to ra learn something rapidly what you can do it is if you have a very clear purpose to why you're doing it and typically if you have an application so here it's all about we're learning we're designing we're building so we're reinforcing that learning from many different points and that way uh, we can engage in rapid learning because I do believe that uh, uh, the encouraging thing is that I do do like to say a lot that like genius is learned. It's like it only takes 10,000 hours to become a genius at something. Just study something for 10,000 hours, you become a genius at it. And that's why kids as, as young as teenagers are, some of them are geniuses. This is not to intimidate you, but to say that, oh yeah, they just focused absolutely autistically on something for 10,000 hours, which is only like three years of your time at 10 hours per day. That's 3,000 hours per year. It takes three years to become a genius. So become a genius at something. Uh, now we've got a lot of distractions that keep us from it, like making a living. And that's the biggest sin in society. That's, that's, like, that's preventing an entire society from becoming a bunch of geniuses because we're still stuck at the level of survival. Man. <laughs> so in the kind of work that we do, we're trying to say, okay, let's, let's address some of this. Um, let's practice making survival super easy because the technology is clearly there. If you understand meters, kilograms, and seconds, if you understand how to build things, uh, basic physics principles, you can get through survival very easy. It's like, trust me, I've gone through this. It's very positive. Is there Brian. a glossary on the OSC? Um, let's talk about one. Yeah. So let's wrap this up by saying 
how do we create this collaborative genius? So in the next six months, <laughs> um, who's, so let me pull this one out. So who's seen the movie Gla Gladiator? Gladiator. Gladiator. Back in the old days. <laughs> Russell so, Brown. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the lines there. Okay, whatever comes out of these gates, we have a higher chance of survival if we all work together. <laughs> if we all work together, we're going to come up come on alive. So what I'm going to do here is out of these gates, my, perhaps my mouth will be a flood of uh, fire hose of information, and we can actually put it to use or survive or create a business out of that when we all work together. So one thing I would like to see if we can really master through the, the next six months for all of us that are here is the collaborative editing of docs. And why? Mm. Why is that? So right now, you know, we're trying to capture this. We're trying to make sure that we capture this on video and make sure this goes out to the world. But if you think about the entire knowledge base of humanity, like what would it take to recreate it all? Um, well, right now, there's a lot of proprietary info, so you can't ever recreate what the world knows today. Like, if the world died, it, its knowledge would die. Um, but how much knowledge is there that, that we need to open... Like, for example, if our goal is with the Global Village Construction Set to open source civilization, like all the technology of it, the technological infrastructure, how much is there? Well, it's... It's, it's some, but it's not, not overwhelmingly a lot. Like, if, in other words, what, what I'm trying to say here is that if you open source that information, if you do that once, it only takes a certain amount of effort. And I would say that amount of effort is very minuscule to the entire effort or energy that exists in the world, like all the people's energy, all that. It's, it's tiny. To open source the entire... Um, essence of civilization. I mean, there's technology, then we can talk about human evolution, but, you know, take technology first to solve material security issues as a basis before we go on to human evolution. But what is that effort? What is that effort? And, and the point is that we can document and open source that relatively easily. It would, like, I don't know, can you attach a number to it? I mean, it's going to be less than a billion bucks, probably. It might be like around a billion bucks or something. It's not a lot. That's like a hundredth of a big company today, right? So, why doesn't it happen? Like, why don't we just all open source all of civilization and everyone can benefit? Well, there's various reasons for that. Uh, but the point is that it's, it's a manageable thing. It can happen. That's what we're trying to do here. So, we're trying to get enough effort just to put it in simple terms, enough effort behind that kind of a process that if you do it once and document it, then it can live forever, it can be immortal. Um, so open source work is immortal, because once you publish it and make it open, like people can build on it forever. It's good if you know how to document it well so that it's easy to access. But one of those things is, so the very important concept, and this is general from general semantics, it's called time binding. The ability, the unique human ability. Animals don't do this. Animals don't learn from past generations. They kind of live. Humans learn from past generations. We have the capacity to do that. It's a general semantics term called time binding. And um, and then I, I extend that. I came, came up with a concept called economic time binding. Economic time binding being how do we actually record knowledge that the next person's life is easier because that actually doesn't happen today like economic time binding doesn't really happen like everybody has to suffer to make a living and that's you know that's the kind of a big picture thing we're trying to say okay how do we make it really easy for anybody to make a living because there's plenty of energy plenty of resources like back to first principles numeracy there's 10,000 times more power from the sun that comes to the earth today than we use so that's the first principle so if you assume that abundance, we can, um, we can survive very well, but there's so much effort being, like, the entire world is about reinventing the wheel. It's, it's completely so, and a lot of people, I don't think, realize that. Um, it's, 
in the essence of how companies work, that they're proprietary, that patents uh, and trade secrets are the rule. And we're trying to say, okay, let's create a different operating system called the open source economy. How would that work? Uh, but the point is that if we can come up with effective ways to document uh, and teach people how to do that, this is feasible. It's, it's doable. Like, uh, you know, enough people put enough eyeballs on a problem, it's, it's solvable, right? So uh, one important tool that we can do is, is editable docs that many people can do in parallel. So um, why is that important? It's, it's because then we can actually put our brains together. If we know how to use that basic tool, it's, it's like combining our intelligence instead of, okay, here's my uh, notebook number 27, right? Uh, that's mine. Like, I, I might take some pictures of it, but that's like, you can't access it because it's physical and so forth, right? Uh, but if you put it on the internet, use cloud editable docs, we can all build on that knowledge together. What does that mean? The power of that is immense. Like, if people knew how to use that, that tool, we can sit down, you know, we, we develop part libraries of interchangeable parts for the things we design. Imagine designing something in super rapid time with up to thousands of people. It's completely doable. Um, that's the why of it. Like, if a large team of people could learn how to do, do that effectively, real time, with communication channels, video, and basic infrastructures, wikis, uh, repositories, then we could have just unprecedented collaboration happen, right? So it's very important, very important to do it. So let's practice that here. And what I want to do, the challenge for us is, I'll be talking, um, talking about in these one hours, and then we actually get into practicing some things. So we will practice some stuff today. But uh, can we try the experiment of, of, for every lecture, we open up a Google Doc. That's one, one cloud collaborative platform that's accessible. There's others. There's ones that are like nonlinear. Um, but Google Docs is one effective one. Uh, and just the ability to work together on it. And so collaborative note taking. Can we do it? Think we can do it? Because um, like, okay, say I'll, I'll be talking here, and the time binding concept means that we can continuously evolve the quality of that knowledge, just keep bringing it up all the time we go back to it. That's the power of the collaborative <coughs> docs. Um, and I think, and that's why like I say that most of the world is about reinventing the wheel, like think about in our life, like, first of all, our memories are, we forget things, right? So we tend to redo things many times. So if we now add the digital medium to it and many people to it, there's a chance that we can accelerate the learning process and create collaborative creation of genius, like exposing the cutting edge knowledge to everybody. So there's some potential there. Uh, it doesn't happen today, as I mentioned, uh, the cutting edge, all the cutting edge, it's pretty much secret, so we can't uh, learn a lot of it. But imagine what would happen if everybody operated that way. They did share that stuff. I mean, things could be much more easy. Like, say we're we're trying to work out a business model for the CD co home. Uh, how to do that? All the details. Well, how many thousands, millions, billions of people have built houses and have a relevant experience? Well, uh, so that's that's the practice of time binding. Like, how do you create mechanisms where that knowledge is meaningfully upgraded continuously forever, right? So we have, a, I think, there's a lot to be learned in that process, and we can uh, practice just make the road by walking by uh, doing that. So uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's session, which is Friday, let's do that. We didn't do that today. I meant to do it today, but I want to get the like maybe we can talk about that for a little bit how could we do that um the simple idea is you've got a doc that everyone edits so technically it's um to do it very effectively you, you have to practice it and it's like you get super fast and it's really efficient um, but say the technical is, is solved i think we have to start with why is that important like do people here believe that we can uh, for example like the motivation i i could see is if we do these design lessons and we keep upgrading this content forever so say 
we took really good notes. Maybe the remote people uh, collaborate on it. Other people added more assets to it. Eventually, we get that whole process to note-taking, collaborative ideation, CAD creation, where tons of people are, are feeding into it. People who are doing uh, graphics assets, business development, everything. Um, so if you can break down that task process, uh, you can involve a lot of people, but, pe but everyone in there has to be aware of the role architecture. That's one thing. But before any of that, I think there's the purpose of why that kind of process is important. Um, so maybe we'll leave it at that. Like, what are your guys' thoughts on that, on the idea of how we can leverage the Google Docs? Because, I mean, this kind of stuff here, the promise I'm trying to make is that I'd like to teach you all that I know in six months, what I learned in practice over, like, say, a decade of just physical experience <laughs> building stuff. Uh, I think that's completely possible. If I didn't bumble around, you know, like today I'm bumbling around all these topics, right? What if we could take that and... Next year, if I presented, we've already got this well organized, and you know we've got key examples and everything. Like this knowledge could be be upgraded forever. I think what I have to share is very important, is is hugely valuable, um, because it I think it pulls more than anything like across more technical disciplines than I, I than I know of anywhere, right? Uh, and the different thing here is that it's based on practice. The thing that we're designing and building all the time and using the stuff so there's this level level of accountability that does not exist um, in most other places uh, I think it's very valuable so with that said um, how do we make this process work thoughts well, some of the bumbling is useful right so hopefully we'll have time for that too so, yeah I mean, <laughs> some some amount of bumbling yes yeah I guess that's how it should be kind of like the notes like my notes are just kind of brain dumps and what I think is important, other people might feel other things are important. So having all of the information in a certain place and then yeah. pruning it mm -hmm. you know, for duplicates is, is something that we can do. And also, um, like you said, role, like the different roles that people can play, maybe some type of uh, you know, like project management system. Yeah, I mean, you're not managing a project. Sure. You're keeping mm -hmm. track of, okay, well, Wes does the game design, he's working on that, maybe he needs help with something that somebody can assist them with, or there's some other thing going on that someone else is working on that someone can be pulled in for. You know, when we're not all together, like in the. In the okay, uh, so what's an action point out of that? What can we do? So, uh, okay, first of all, uh, action point. Give me an action point on that. So, so what can we do tomorrow? I, go ahead. No, I was going to say. Um, yeah. What's your name? Joshua. Yeah, building on what Joshua said, uh, all of us take notes on different things, so if you stuff it into a single Google Doc, which will be unstructured, that would be easy, right? You don't have to think about what's a heading or what's a block related ideas. You just dump everything from each person, and then maybe a second round, if someone goes through and says, like, okay, well, there's duplicates, like three people took notes on this, and this must be important, or, you know, these things belong together. That's like editing or organization work that can be done after the initial dump. Are you saying that the initial dump is not on a collaborative doc? No, it is. It is. It, it is. is. So everyone's uh, yeah. dumping to it. That, that would be easy. Just, right? just so, like I'm yeah. Yeah. putting what I wrote literally on the doc, and it's the same exact thing. But the, then, like you yeah. said, yeah. multiple mm -hmm. iterations of something being written indicates importance as well. You know, that, that can, that you can kind of analyze what's going there you out. go okay so how about we start a doc like with as many pages as there are people and each person starts that their page and then you can always add new pages so you just add the sec just keep adding more pages if you run out of space which you can definitely do right. and then the first thing is mm -hmm. like yeah if people took notes on that one so, someone can edit it and say oh, okay this is important Pe all, all people took notes on that so yeah you, you capture everything and then you can start winnowing through it um, that's one. What, okay, how about now? That needs a lot of editing there because people are. So, any ideas about that? Because I, I have questions mm -hmm. about that. Because my my first thing about it is okay. Let's do that one page. We're taking notes. Like we're talking. There might be multiple pages that, but people like multiple people pump into that. Like, not maybe not one person per <laughs> one page per person. That's that's getting a little too ridiculous. Because if you have a hundred people unscalable 
So always we ask for scalable, modular, open, collaborative, transparent. Okay, so starting with the mission, OSC mission, right, right, collaborative, right, right, right. <laughs> design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. Okay, so what we said I think fails the abundance because once you have a thousand people you're not going to go through a thousand people's notes unless you have AI so maybe that, that is inclusive once you put in AI or whatever um, but um, transparent like how transparent is a you know you got a hundred people with ten pages each how transparent is a thousand pages to one person I mean it's, I don't know. it's there but it's but like you said I, I you don't even have the time really yeah like mm. So I, I'd say let's let's reduce that number. Not not one page for everybody. Yeah. Not so one page for everybody. From my perspective, like I don't even think I don't even think Google Docs is capable of uh, of the type of uh, like functionality we need. For example, like we need to be able to render like a three D CAD model embedded within a collaboration document. And ideally, like, if someone makes an edit, it is literally uh, updated immediately and automatically in, ideally. A, in a collaborative. Does a tool problem. exist like that, though? Um, what we need, I think, is something like uh, Git, but with, like, hardware visualization and, uh, like, like, a diff like, a different approach of Git. So maybe building on Git and then adding hardware visualization or better tools. That are open. Uh, that would not include the people who are not tech savvy, though. It has to be super simple. Yeah. So, well, how do we make it simple? Git is pretty accessible with uh, the right GUI application. We know people <laughs> aren't like are smart enough to use the shed. Well, you can have it. I, I, I do, but yeah, like trying to do it on command line, and then like going and read the manual, which you have to do for the things like that. You lost me a GUI. <laughs> I'm just like like Git versus GitHub. Like yeah. you want GitHub and you can commit and make new branches. That's too technical for for a novice, man. We understand it, but not everyone's going to understand that. The learning, I would suggest the learning curve. You can learn it in an hour. Like if you want to collaborate, like my goal for the free CAD thing is why I ask why I'm asking you to record your experience. I want to teach somebody in an hour. We've seen this. Plenty of people can do it in an hour. At, at, typically, the guys that don't know CAD do better because they don't have prejudice from other software packages. <laughs> um, but the onboarding, like if you want to scale this process, you've got to be able to do it, teach a person. It has to be simple. Like I'm suggesting docs because I think a person can do docs quick. Like you can start editing. You might not get the advanced functionality of it, but I think the concept, the, the concept of the very concept of cloud collaborative that's in Google Docs we can add more tools to it so what do we do tomorrow to make this effective um, and let's talk about let's <coughs> close this discussion in 10 minutes at 925 let's, let's just get some ideas on this like what what can we I mean obviously so let's do a doc let's start with Google Docs not 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 Docs Google Slides that's the multiple page uh, you can put pictures in there uh, short of the automatic update on a CAD, copy and paste the picture, human. Um, it can get you um, embedded spreadsheets, links, I mean hyperlinks, real-time, uh, collaborative, it's there. You can do pictures and text. And there's almost, I think there's like a pretty good open source software that does that these days too, pretty much. Uh, eventually, uh, I don't know if there's any like data scientists, but um, I mean you could read through um, the document with like natural language processing as well. But that's that's kind of mm. something else that's out there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, just the same way, if you're using Apple, the voicemail will tell you, uh, yeah. will give you a transcript of what somebody's saying. If we could do something like that and just make comments on the oh, um, uh, what what can we use for that? That can feed in like can that feed into that real-time doc so we can start upgrading it at the same time yeah does it exist then it's a book and you just edit the book or something like that oh, that's right. um, <laughs> um <laughs> like reality check at all times like okay great ideas is there something that does it tomorrow 
I hope. Well, Most of the like oh, look it up. Uh, yeah. like uh, voice to text. Yeah, is really really bad. If you actually use them, like the accuracy is uh, like trash. Yeah. But the closest thing you could get is mm-hmm. maybe trading a model from your own voice using something like um, Mozilla's common common voice portrait. So, so it's not really accessible outside of proprietary thing. Mm-hmm. And most of that is because it's most of like the voice to text is processed over the internet on like massive servers. Mm-hmm. And that data is owned by the company, so. Yeah. I mean, what I'm, like, just in terms of utility, what I'm thinking is, I don't think that always, like, having a big document of information is going to be that valuable in the sense of what I would like to see is, like, there's a refinement of, let's say, one page that represents the most important elements that's maybe, like, a hyperlink to you know, deeper explanations. And I've been in a Google Doc with, let's say, a handful of people before, and you're not stepping on each other's toes as much as you would think. You know, like, you can kind of, you're tracking, you're listening to what's being said, and you're sort of building it out. So, but it would take people in real time on their computers, if that makes sense, rather than, I mean, the only person that's on our computer right now is us two. So we would be the only people that would... Yeah, so the first thing is everyone open up their computers like tomorrow, so that's that's the thing. If you want to make it digital and collaborative, that's the way we can... So all you guys remotely as well, if we all go into that dock, I think it can start getting exciting as we're doing. Now what I can do already is on the wiki, there's from last year's, there's seeded design guides on a lot of topics. So what we can do is pull in a start a relevant dock before right before that possibly like seed all those templates there is a bunch of design design guides like we have a house design guide 3d printer design guide tractor design guide like a bunch of stuff and they're you know maybe just started or or pretty pretty evolved um but that's the idea that uh ideally we, this is about design we're creating design guides. It's literally like we're collaboratively editing this design guide. So say we take the one I have, you know, say we talk about, uh, I don't know, the house design. Um, well, there's already a doc started, so we maybe start in there and, and we can uh, work from it. Now, how do you work? One, one concept is like, how do you not, how do you manage, like say there's an existing doc and how do you manage not trashing that doc? Uh, I think um, when there's so some people might be intimidated because there's already a bunch of stuff written there. It might be neat. Some might be afraid, like, oh, uh, I don't want to mess it up. So, but I think the Google Docs let you do that because you you can okay. Say you've got this. Some parts are refined. Just open up a new page. Go to a different page. Go to your your own corner if you're shy. But I think it's a lot about <coughs> kind of learning the culture of how it works. I think that's the most important part. I think for all of us here, um, yeah, yeah. Just I think getting really good at just the execution of it, because um, one person, so that's Paul, who, who's participating remotely and part of this, but he didn't show up today. But he, he's like, he knows how to do the Google Doc thing. He said, "You're forgetting how much like the technical skill required just to be really fluent in it." Like, he said, "It's like we're forgetting how hard it is for somebody that's new." Uh, that's a thing to consider, but I, I think when you once you start doing it, you can only get better at it by practice. So the only thing we can do is invite people, and and if someone's completely unskilled, just I mean, just yeah, open I mean, up a new page, just start typing, man, just go for just it. Include them, and then we're gonna have to like this is kind of the first time this is being done, so we're gonna have to really yeah do the initial heavy lifting anyway. Yeah, with the documentation and with kind of formatting. Things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but for tomorrow, I'd say uh, if I if I get a chance, uh, hopefully, I'm trying to get up. Um, in terms of my schedule, I'm trying to get up a few hours before this to prepare for that. Today, I I didn't get much sleep, but <laughs> I was ordering parts, and you guys were up, staying up all late, come from the airport pretty late. But uh, see the document. We can start with that, and don't be afraid about trashing it. I think the culture here is like publish early and often. Don't worry about trashing. There's a thing about the Google Docs. You can restore old versions. You can't mess it up. So it's actually already built into that. 
Uh, if somebody spams it, and we actually do it open to the public for editing, don't worry about somebody trashing it because you can always restore it. And we've never had vandalism on our docs yet to date, so um, I'm not sure we necessarily expect to because you can restore the revisions immediately. So why would somebody want to spam it if they're going to be excluded? <laughs> Opposite of our mission. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's, um, I don't know, any, we've got a minute on this topic. Uh, Are there designated note takers or is everyone? We don't, no, but that's what I would encourage. Like, let's have everybody be a note taker unless we think somebody should be dedicated. But I think everybody has something to contribute. Like one person might, Say there's a like a graphics guy that's participating and he's in the background actually draw, drawing up a design and he <laughs> blasts that into the docs. Like, Whoa! Um, I think like there could be all kinds of. Uh, I think we should open it up to everybody's genius filtering through it. Um, however, people want. I don't see a nece necessity of dedicated note takers. If there is a dedicated note taker. Uh, yeah, I mean that would probably like someone who's just like really good at that. Yeah, they would course help a lot we don't have that person on a team right now um, I can't do it certainly uh, maybe we could recruit somebody from remote like the guy Paul who's good at it um, you know make an invitation to others hey join us on this um, if someone can dedicate themselves so any thoughts from the remote people uh, on how we do this effectively I just uh, mentioned in the chat setting up a communication platform such as Discord or Slack so we can mm -hmm. communicate. Yeah. Oh, I see Discord does exist. It's on a wiki. First so, so the first ah. thing, yeah, uh, on the, it's like I'm going to always answer it's on the wiki, but what that means is just go, go, go search it within the wiki. There's a search box and so for example if you go to wiki um, there's a search box and I'm gonna say discord search box yeah it took me to the OSC discord channel so uh, <laughs> sure it's all there yeah, share oh, it in cool. the chat okay that'll help a lot I was wondering, well, I was wondering where that was yep yeah but um, in this kind of collaboration um, Let's let's move on to the next part. Do we want to take a little break? Maybe a few minute break, bathroom break, and then go back. What I want to get into right now, right after this, is so we, we want to do some hands-on design. So what we can do, uh, there's concepts like the work logs, um, version histories on the wiki, like just getting into the wiki and the Google Docs in, in there and stuff. Let's just start doing it and also crack crack open a copy of FreeCAD. Who in here has got the badge, FreeCAD badge? We're like... I do. Yeah. <laughs> Paul? Yet. Not yet, right? Uh, me. Yeah. Yeah, so most of us here do. Now, so so let's get into, awesome. right into this collaborative, um, right after the little break, let's take like five or ten minutes, um, right after the break, get, get right into, we're going to start building some house modules today. Does that sound great. okay? Great. Yeah. Sounds great. <laughs> So we're going to design some things for them or generate documentation or generate build procedures. A thing we talked about here is, which really came out recently is jigs. Let's design some jigs to make the build more effective. So we can do that. Let's crank out FreeCAD and let's all work on the logs. So when we get back, we'll start the collaborative process on a doc and we can involve, of course, you guys at remote and us here. So cool. let's take it five minutes. Let's be back like nine and thirty-five. Oh. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. <laughs> 